it's time. We're going to get started. Welcome, everybody. We're sure we'll have a few more that trickle in, but we are starting on time for our people on Facebook and for YouTube. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for watching. We're continuing our study of 1 Corinthians, and we're in the third part of the third chapter. So if you guys want to turn there in your Bibles, a few discussion questions to start us off. If you were building your own house, what materials would you use? Some people like log cabins. Some people like to use stone. Maybe a craftsman a house and that used a lot of stone. Why would you pick those materials that you want to build your house with? And second, true or false question. Business practices work in a church. Why or why not? So uh, talk about those two things at your table or at home. And we'll come back together in just a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see if you want to call over us, it's fine. Okay, well, some of it, I think. Uh, we'll see. Uh, some people generally trickle through. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, so, what do you think? Oh, I think if I had yeah. it, boy. If I had somebody else to build it for that, I'd like to have a log cabin. We're talking about what we build with, what we build God's temple with. And one of the things I want to talk about to help us think about this is a little place in Kentucky. Maybe you've heard of it, but it, ha it houses hundreds of bars of pure gold. Oh, Any guesses? Fort Knox. Fort yeah, Knox, Knox, that's right. <laughs> Enough gold weighing more than 4,600 tons of 
goal. When we think of Fort Knox, we usually visualize it being nothing more than a vault that holds gold. But the place where the gold hole, where the gold is held, is actually a very small part of a military base covering 109,000 acres, spread across three counties, which houses 23,000 soldiers. You need a lot of soldiers to guard that much gold. But the vault itself is built to be impenetrable. It's constructed of granite, steel, and concrete. The vault door alone weighs more than 20 tons. In fact, there might be more steel than gold in Fort Knox. The vault is made of steel plates, steel beams, and steel cylinders. To open the door, several staffers at the depository must individually dial in separate combinations, known only to them, and even the President of the United States doesn't have the combination to the vault. I could tell you more about its security, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Over the years, in addition to gold, the vault has, at Fort Knox has protected um, several other countries' riches, such as the English crown jewels. It has held the Magna Carta. It has held the Gutenberg Bible. And back in the early 1940s, during World War II, it held the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence. I guarantee you, Fort Knox is built well. Um, and so, as we take a look at how we build the church tonight, that's what Paul's talking about. Of course, the desire, when you build something for the Lord, you build his church, which is the bride of Christ, it's what Christ died for, you want to build it right. And that's what Paul is talking about tonight. If you remember, two weeks ago, we talked about how all of chapter 3 is about the church. And verses 1 through 5 was about the family producing maturity. The church should be a family that produces mature Christians. Last week, verses 6 through 9, Paul described the church as a field that produces quality, quantity. Uh, we're supposed to have a harvest, a plentiful harvest. And then tonight, verses 10 through 23, he describes the church as a temple that produces quality. A temple that produces quality. Now there are two views of this passage. Some say this passage can be talking about us and our spiritual growth and what we're building in our spiritual lives. And there are some that take this passage that it can be taken that way. And I would argue that that is an incorrect interpretation of the scripture. Because any time the word you is used in describing the building of this temple, it's always in the plural. So he's talking about the church as a whole. He's talking about the church as a whole. The body, the local body of believers. One thing Paul wants to emphasize is that the church is not a pastor's. The church doesn't belong to the pastor. And the church doesn't belong to the congregation. Who does the church belong to? God. God, that's right. So, uh, God, Paul is saying that you are part of something that has great value. You hold the Spirit of God inside you. You as the church are God's temple. Now, I think it's interesting that God would use the term temple to describe the church. Uh, the temple in Jerusalem captures a lot of people's imaginations. Uh, it certainly did in that day, uh, and it still captures people's imaginations today. The Jewish historian Josephus reported that the temple was covered on all sides with massive plates of gold. And when the sun struck it, it radiated so fiery a flash that persons strained to even look at it. Uh, they were compelled to avert their eyes from its glare. The temple of God was a wondrous thing in the Old Testament. The temple where it was where God dwelt. But when Jesus came, all that changed. Because in 1 Corinthians 3.16, it's declared, You now. He's talking to the church. You are God's temple. God's spirit dwells in you. God doesn't need a physical temple anymore. Because you and I are that temple. And it dwells in us as a people not the building. 
So let's see what Paul says. Verses 10 through 11. Let's start there. Chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. Uh, Miss Patsy, you might start us off with verses 10 through 11. Okay. By the grace of God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. No one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. All right. I like it when the foundation's already laid. I don't do a lot of building, but I've done some decks. And the decks that we've done, the most important part is putting those posts in the ground and in concrete. And that's the hardest part of the job of the deck, that foundation. But it's the most important. So you got to dig down. you got to get through all those rocks and the roots and... Uh, a lot of times there's a lot of gravel. It's very difficult to do. For some reason, we're always replacing the deck in the middle of summer. When it's as hot as all get out. Uh, but it's that, that is the foundation. If that foundation, if those foundation posts aren't steady, the rest of the deck will fall apart and not do what it's supposed to do. I'm glad that the foundation is already done for the church. Christ has laid, is the foundation of the church. Not only has he laid it, he is the foundation of the church. But he says it takes a lot of people to build the church. But Christ is the foundation of the church. A church must not be built on a personality, a leader, a certain doctrine, or philosophy, or even missions. As much as I love missions. Miss Patsy loves missions. A church can't be built. We're going to be nothing but a missions church. It can't be built on that. Or even a children's ministry. There are the churches that... Uh, we're just going to do children's ministry, and that's going to be our MO. That's going to be who we are as a church. The foundation can't be built on a person, a doctrine, a ministry style, a ministry type. It has to be built on Jesus Christ. Churches that are built on anything else will not last. All right. Mr. Ron, actually, um, Mr. Um, Bob, why don't you do 12 through 17? Any one builder on the foundation with gold, silver, or precious stone, wood, hay, or straw, each builder work will be plainly seen. For the day will make it clear because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what kind of work uh, each one has done. It's the 13? It's the 17. Oh. In what someone has built survives, he will receive reward. If someone works is burnt up, he will suffer the loss. He himself will be saved, but only as through, uh, as through fire. Do you know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If someone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, which is what we are. All right. There we see that we must build with the right materials. We need to build with the right materials. Verse 12, he talks about gold, silver, and precious stones. These were all used to build Solomon's temple. They represent permanence, something that stays a long time, beauty, and those things were valuable. And they were hard to obtain. He says this is what we need to build the church with. Of course, that's figuratively. He's What does those things um what those things represent, we're going to talk about in a second. He says those who build with those type of materials will be rewarded. They'll be rewarded. Verse 15 tells us those who do shoddy work, the fire will reveal that. Testing will reveal that. Think about it. Wood, we build with wood, but it doesn't last as long as stone does it. Um, if you have a tornado coming down the path, I would much rather have a house made out of concrete and brick than I would a house made out of wood. Hay, of course we know, does not last. Straw does not last. Each of those things are passing. They're temporary. They're ordinary. They're ugly. They're cheap. They're easy to obtain. Paul is saying we need to build on what lasts. And before we go into what that is, um, I want to point out I just learned this a little bit, but the Catholic Church will use verses 13 through 
15 to justify purgatory. The fact that we're, our sin is burned off before we can enter into heaven. This is clearly not talking about our righteousness. It's talking about our works and testing our works and what lasts in this world. If it's built well, what we build in this world, it will sustain the fire. If it doesn't, it's not going to last. It's not going to it's not going to survive difficult times or crisis. So it's pretty much, very much a stretch to say that is talking about our eternal souls and being cleaned before we're able to enter eternity. All right? It's very clear that these precious stones and these precious materials is the word of God. There's been a theme throughout this whole chapter. The word of God was meat. For the family in the first section. We're talking about going from milk to meat. How do we get go from milk to meat? The word of God. Then he talked about the seed for the field. The seed was the word of God. It's the seed that helps things grow. And this week, the word of God is the materials for the temple. So I got three verses there for you to look up. I'll maybe assign these. Mr. Ron, would you mind looking up Proverbs 3? 13 through 15. Miss Patsy, if you wouldn't mind looking up Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. Bob, if you wouldn't mind looking up Proverbs 8, 10 through 11. Hey, Johnny. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Thank you. Glad you made it. Sorry I'm late. You're fine. We take people that are late. <laughs> I'd much rather have you late than not at all. I appreciate it. Thank you. I am ready. Proverbs, Proverbs 3. 8, 13 through 15. Yes, sir. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can be compared with her. The All right. Beauty and build of wisdom. Yeah, wisdom. And we know that we get the wisdom of God. It's the whole book of Proverbs is always talking about wisdom. It uses the pronoun her for wisdom. But it's very clear that we get our wisdom, we get our godly wisdom from the word of God. And he compares that wisdom to those precious materials. Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom, and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. All right, thank you very much. Again, that wisdom we find in the scripture compared to those fine jewels, compared to silver, compared to a treasure. All right, Proverbs 8, 10 through 11. Receive my instructions rather than silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and desirable things cannot be compared to her. All right, again, rubies and treasure. So we need to make sure that we are building the church based on the word of God, not on things of man or man's understanding or man's supposed wisdom. This passage tells us as the church is put to test, each person's work will be known how effective it is and what they actually built with. We are to build our church not on the wisdom of man, but on the word of God. All right, verses 18 through 20. Mr. Ron, will you read that? Couple of verses uh, 18 for 20 of uh, chapter 8. Uh, first, no, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians. Um, 1 Corinthians 3. 18 through, we're back there in our original passage. Sorry about right. that. I sent you all over the Proverbs, didn't I? This is my new Bible. Awesome. And so the pages are real slow. Yeah. Well, I'll get there. You'll get there. That's good. Got to break that sucker in. Chapter 3 and uh, verses 18. Yes. Let no one deceive himself with 
anyone among you thinks he is wise with this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise and that they are futile. All right. Here we see we need to build according to the right plan. The right plan. He's made this point before, but he's making it again here. Man's wisdom is stupidity next to God's wisdom. So we should seek after God's wisdom. We can't use worldly principles of business to run a church. We must use godly principles to build the church. We can't use promotion, prestige, influence, and money. We talked about this with Miss Patsy and I just a little bit earlier. Business is all about power. Business is all about making money. Business is all about succeeding over others, placing yourself above others. And uh, that position that I can reach. And the church should be run by Jesus' leadership style. What did Jesus do to lead the church? He served. He made sure that everybody was more important than himself. He put their needs above his own. And that's our model for leadership as well. So we can't take business practices from the world and apply them to the church. We must use things instead of promotion, prestige, influence, and money. We should use prayer, the power of the Spirit, humility, sacrifice, and service. All right, verses 21 through 23. Johnny, you want to read that one for us? Uh, 21. Starting with verse 21 through 23. Therefore let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Abraham or the world of life or of death, or things present or things to come, all are yours. We must build with the right motive. With the right motive. And the motive we should have is to bring glory to God. When we're giving all the glory to God, there's not room for any man to boast. We have nothing to boast in. Things go well here at Flint Hill Baptist Church. It's not anything that I've done. It's all God. Um, and if that should be the case in any church, uh, it's God that makes things succeed. Verse 21 through 23 says all things belong to God and his church. That means we all have all things as children of God. That's hard for us to kind of understand right now. But when we are heirs with Christ, heirs of God, we have all things. We will rule for eternity with Christ over creation. We have been given all things. That is the promise of God's word. So do we need to vie for power here on earth? Do we need to, to peck and scratch and pull our way into places of power or prestige or glory? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There's no need to compare ourselves to others. There's no need to boast in ourselves. There's no need to have competition rivalry, one person's success in the kingdom of God is all of our success in the kingdom of God. When God is glorified, we all win. I always pray, I pray, get together with the pastors at Flint Hill Baptist, at uh, Fort Mill once a month. First Baptist, TPK, Cornerstone, Glen Rock. And when I pray, many times I'll pray for the success of their churches. I'll pray that Flint, Fort, Fort, Map, Fort Beth, First Baptist will continue to be a bulwark in this community, continue to be successful, continue to grow, continue to be, they make a huge impact in this community, and I pray that they will continue to do so, even more so, because we're all on the same team. We're all working for the kingdom of God, and when they succeed, we all succeed. 
So that's how we should view our fellow churches. We should pray for them on a regular basis. Okay. Any questions about that passage or something that maybe stuck out to you as we read it? Humility. Humility. We think, and unfortunately, we spend so much time thinking of, we have the Building and Grounds Committee, right? <laughs> and we have to deal with all the issues, the plumbing and the, the brick and the things that are falling apart. The wall on the front of the lawn is falling apart and crumbling, uh, trying to make sure that our children's building looks good. If we spend as much time worrying about building the things that Paul's talking about, all those things would take care of themselves, would they not? All right, so you got three questions there to discuss at your table. Those of you at home, I'm going to read them off to you. You can think about these as we discuss. Number one, what does it mean that you are the temple of God? What does it mean that you are the temple of God? Two, what does the, all this attention God gives to his temple, the church, say about the importance of the local church? Of the local church. And third, what are ways you can build into our church gold, silver, and precious stones? That's pretty cool. You as an individual can build into our church some of these precious stones. What are ways that you can do that? Have at it.
the most precious stones and materials that we can build the church with are new believers that we invest in, that we make disciples, that we grow, that are using their gifts to serve the church. That's how we best build the church. Uh, we don't best build the church by building on another addition, by making the sanctuary bigger. No, we build the church by investing in people growing Christians, making them from milk to meat, making them world changers. That's my goal, that uh, we at Flint Hill Baptist Church, we produce world changers, people that go and change their workplaces, change the world in which they go into, uh, send people out into the world as missionaries, uh, but not just missionaries. They're missionaries in their workplaces. They're missionaries in their schools. They're world changers. So that leads me to next week and an advertisement for next week. Next week we begin our ser Equip to Serve. That's one of the ways we can build the church right. When we equip the believers to serve his church, we are building with gold and silver and precious rubies. And so uh, starting next week, we'll begin our series. And it's not too different than what we're studying in 1 Corinthians because as we talked about on Sunday, 1 Corinthians 12 was all about spiritual gifts. So even as we talk about serving uh, in our different way we're gifted to serve the church, we want to spend a lot of time in 1 Corinthians. So it's not like we're deviating from 1 Corinthians at all. So that will be next week. For those of you watching at home, that's going to be a very personal study. It's going to be a very interactive study. I encourage you to come join us in person. But if you're watching online, you're really not going to get a lot out of that because you don't have the material in front of you. You don't have... Uh, you won't have the benefit of filling out, doing the little uh, surveys and the little exercises that we'll do. So starting next week, we will do our prayer time at the beginning for the first 20 minutes. And we will uh, do that over Facebook Live. But at that end of that 20 minutes, we'll then cut off that broadcast and then we will go into the Equip to Serve. So that's how we'll operate uh, in the days to come. But my encouragement to you watching at home, come join us next week. Okay, uh, let's enter into our prayer time. We're going to start with missionaries first, like we did last week. I'm going to give you a missionary to pray for. I hope you prayed for your missionary last week, if you were here this past week, each day. So we'll just go around the room, and you just pray for your missionary, take a few minutes to think, see where they're at, where they're serving, and then there's a prayer request at the bottom, and so you can just include that in your prayer as you pray. Mr. Bob, you mind starting us off? Sure. Gracious and wonderful Heavenly Father, you know, we're lifting up today Billy and Sarah Judge. You know, they are part of that Seal Creek uh, Steel City Church that you have plant that you had directed them to go to their church planner, and Lord, it's in Pittsburgh. And Lord, we know that why you chose them to be there, and they're asking us to reach out to help them to form relationships with the people in the city who are spiritually wounded, and uh, and that they're they're. Uh, skeptical of a result of culture and self-reliance, which marks the average Pittsburgher. And Lord, we ask you to, you know, there is always that race issue that keeps coming up over and over and over again. And Lord, we know that we can 
overcome that through your blessing, through your guidance, and your watching over each and every one of us to show the love that you have for us, that we can mimic that to the love that you have for each and that we can love on one another. So guide them and direct them in uh, the, the church as they start. In your name we ask it. Amen. And while we're praying for church planters in the Pittsburgh area, we also pray for uh, family working in uh, Lawrenceville, Georgia, uh, a suburb of uh, Atlanta, I believe. And uh, there, the family of Raphael and Ora Pichela, uh, they uh, are working there in uh, church planting. And I imagine also they've, they've gotten their kids involved and their kids are in this uh, picture also. So, Father, we pray that you would encourage them, Lord, as uh, we may sometimes get discouraging, uh, working and working, trying to build your church. And, Lord, uh, use use them, use the, even the, the children to, to reach other kids, other uh, people, uh, and uh, as you use them to, to witness to their neighbors, Lord, to bring them in to being disciple makers. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do and how you're going to use this family. Uh, in Jesus' name. Lord, we come and we come to pray for Dustin and Jill Connor. They're from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We want to lift uh, them and lift their kids up, Lord, that they're that uh, for many, has been unchurched in the community. The reason is, Lord, that you know the, there's restrictions still in phase one level. They can't leave their county uh, by Canada law. But Lord, you know what the situation is in their life and every single of our lives, Lord. That God and protect them as they go out and minister to you and tell and be the and be the, the disciples that they should be to other people in their community. Lord, you know what's going on in their lives and you know you know every hair they have on their heads lord you know every you know what their the convictions lord and just bring the holy spirit into in their lives lord that they they could be a witness to you lord we want to pray for this family pray for those around them or pray for their families that are around them and pray for the pastor that got perse persecuted lord that you know, he was doing what he was wanted to do, Lord. You know, we have to pray for our pastors also, Lord, that, you know, they get persecuted on a day-by-day -day basis. We need to lift our pastors up in, in, all, in our local churches also, but all around our country, Lord. And lift, and we, we give you glory, and honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, as we continue in your presence, uh, I give thanks for Amber and Vicki Safai and their two children. Lord, you have called them to minister in Cincinnati, but not only in Cincinnati, among the Arab and Muslim communities. And this it's a difficult time now here in the United States, and so I ask for protection for this family. I ask for good health and 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 also wisdom and knowledge of how to work amongst the Arab and Muslim community. And Lord, uh, they have there is a first Arabic church in Cincinnati. 
and they asked that we would pray for them and that God would provide for this church as well as for their ministry to the Arabs and Muslims in Cincinnati. Lord, I place them in your hands because I know you will take care of them and you will guide them in what you have asked them to do in Jesus' name. Yeah, Father, just pray for Brian and Sandy Steyer. Brian is the chaplain for the Mason Fire Department in Mason, Tennessee, and he's praying for the safety of his firefighters who face challenges of having the needed resources to cover a town of about 600 people, while also providing emergency medical services to a federal con correction facility with 800 inmates and staff. Lord, I just pray that you'll help him minister to the community that where you've placed him. Lord, I also want to pray for Cheeseburger, as he is our chaplain in residence here and uh, ministers to the Pineville Police Department. And Lord, he's just discouraged in his work there. Uh, he scheduled a worship service on Sunday, and nobody, hardly anybody showed up. And so he's just discouraged. I pray you encourage him, give him other avenues to be able to minister and speak into those firefighters' lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, take your uh, missionary, pray for him this week. Send them a letter, a note, or an email. Let them know you're praying for them. Thank you, Patsy, for praying for my hometown. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay, we're going to switch to our church needs. You see um, those listed at the top of your page? We get to offer a prayer of praise for our finances. We are like over $5,000 over. God is just blessing us financially, and so we want to give praise for that. Praise for worship on Sunday. I'll be presenting the eighth action step that we've been working on. Can't believe we're already to the last one. It's our last one this Sunday. And it is all about reaching our immediate community. And so pray for that. Pray for all our church refocusing efforts. Pray for our children's ministry. We had four over in the nursery on Sunday, so that's a good start. But we uh, need to do a lot better. And so we're doing excellent at ministering to those who come. We pray that God will send us more. Pray that we will meet the needs of our community. I want you to pray for your one at the table and give a praise for the finances. So you just choose uh, while you're praying. Pick one of those to pray for and uh, we'll just give you a few minutes to pray for those things around your table.
right. Thank you for praying for those needs. Some uh, recent special needs we need to pray for. Lee Britt is Vicki Moore's mom. Vicki Moore's dad, actually. Hospitalized with congestive heart failure. We can pray for LaDonna Buchanan, Joanne Payne's daughter, who has lung cancer. We can pray for Jane Edwards. She had surgery yesterday, and it did not go well. Uh, they got in there and realized she had many more cysts than they were anticipating. She's going to need a full, basically, hysterectomy to get all the cysts that are in that area out. And she's pretty discouraged. So just pray for Jane. Pray for Ron. He's having a test done tomorrow. Hopefully it will be one more step to being able to do something instead of just having tests on his back so they can get him back to normal as well. So just pray for the Edwards family. So then... Uh, as a result of the MRI, did they uh, make him, advise him of going for the second test? Yeah. Jenny Gamble has knee problems. Stephanie Hammonds found out this week. Uh, she got her results. She does have breast cancer in both breasts. She doesn't. Know, we don't know what type, what uh, stage, or any of that yet. What the treatment will be, but uh, she's got a long road ahead of her, to say the least. And just we, so we need to pray for him, pray for her, pray for Kendall and their family in the days to come. We pray for Omar Hernandez, who's a friend of Lena Thede, who has a heart transplant. Sandra Stiles, who's dealing with lung cancer. Is there anybody you know we need to add to the list? Take a person or two off that list and spend some time praying around your table. Pray at home for those names. Lift up to you today, Stephanie Hammond, Julie, we just found out that uh, she has breast cancer in both of her breasts, Julie, but she's a young woman, and, and uh, it's a tragic uh, report, and she has lung cancer, and Lord, uh,
you for joining us tonight. I want to encourage you at this time to spend some time praying for your personal prayer requests. God wants to hear those. He wants to help you in those situations. Spend some time in praises. Well, how's God been faithful to you? Finish your time of prayer praising God for a while. He's been good to you this week. Thank you for joining us. Hope to see you next week.